there are many stepping stones to space. And some of the most significant efforts by our nation took place during 1960. In August, Major Robert White, an Air Force test pilot in the National Aeronautics and Space Administration's X-15 program, planted a new milestone. A B-52 carried White and the experimental craft to launch altitude over the vast desert range of the Air Force Flight Test Center in California. Only eight days before this flight, NASA test pilot Joe Walker had pushed this same X-15 to a new speed record for a piloted aircraft, 2,150 miles per hour. Now, Major White, in a routine test of the experimental craft's more advanced power plant, is on the threshold of an altitude record for manned flight, over 130,000 feet. The flight was a success. Now, just one more job grease this baby in at nearly 200 miles per hour. Safe and sound, with a new record in his pocket, Major White beams with satisfaction at having nailed another rung in the ladder to manned space flight. His record altitude, 136,500 feet, higher than any human before him. While we worked hard toward putting man into space, we also directed efforts to getting him back in an emergency from extreme altitudes. This is the Project Excelsior Gondola, which carried Captain Joseph Kittinger to the outer fringes of the Earth's atmosphere for an epical parachute jump. The balloon was launched from a town prophetically called Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, near Holloman Air Force Base. Aerospace medical specialists hope to establish criteria for planning safe escape methods from aerospace craft. The balloon was launched at 5.30 a.m. on August 16th. An hour and a half later, it reached its zenith, 102,000 800 feet above sea level. The moment of truth. Captain Kittinger prepares to jump. Almost 20 miles. Straight down. At 18,000 feet, his parachute opened automatically. Kittinger had fallen free for 10 minutes and at peak velocity had been moving at 614 miles per hour. On the ground, safe and happy. His associates pull off the 155 pounds of clothing and equipment which protected his 165 pound frame. You talk about high steps. Captain Joe Kittinger can tell you about the world's highest. As bold an achievement as this jump proved to be, another equally spectacular achievement in the Air Force Space Program occurred just four days later. At Vandenberg Air Force Base, a Thoragena rocket is poised to blast a Discoverer 14 into orbit. The discoverer orbits the Earth 16 times. And then on the 17th orbit, specially equipped C-119s of ARDC 6593rd Recovery Squadron were standing by over the Pacific to snatch a capsule ejected from the satellite as it parachuted earthward. The parachute of this 84-pound package was snared by a large loop trailing behind the airplane. It was caught on the third pass at an altitude of 8,500 feet. Safely aboard. This is the climax to months of training and waiting for this proud crew 
which was in the right place at the right time. At Hickam Air Force Base, Hawaii, the first of many plaudits for the crew is read by General Amon O'Donnell. To Captain Harold Mitchell, the aircraft commander, the Distinguished Flying Cross, and to his crew members, the Air Medal. At Air Research and Development Command Headquarters at Andrews Air Force Base, Lieutenant General Bernard Schriever presents Space Primus Awards to the recovery crew and to others who have made personal contributions to this nation's space program. To Captain Kittinger, an oak leaf cluster to his distinguished flying cross and the Primus Award for his jump. To Major White for his record altitude flight in the X-15. In these Air Force men, we see the boldness of the human spirit, which now transcends even the limits of Earth. To be at top combat efficiency, the various elements of our Air Force keep their skills honed to a fine edge. Like these SAC crews awaiting the alert signal in their 1960 combat competition. Part of the judging of these crews is how fast they can get from their alert quarters to their airplane and ready to roll. During 1960, the B-58 Hustler became operational, and two crews competed, with one winning the best bombing award. Refueling is another factor in SAC's combat competition, and all types of planes compete. Each of SAC's numbered air forces sent one plane of each type and two crews per airplane. Thus, there were 52 crews striving to be the best of the best in bombing, navigation, refueling, and electronics countermeasures, as well as ground alert posture. On the awards day, General Thomas S. Power, Commander-in-Chief of SAC, arrived to participate in the final day's activities. This is the climax to a truly remarkable demonstration of professional airmanship. The achievements of these SAC crews, from the maintenance man to the aircraft commander, reflect the strength of this nation's primary deterrent force. The overall competition winner for 1960, the 11th Bomb Wing from Altus Air Force Base. Colonel Ramputi accepts the Fairchild Trophy, hallmark of the best of the best in this, the 12th SAC Combat Competition. Tactical Air Command 2 flexed its muscles in 1960. TAC, which operates on a theory of high mobility with composite airstrike forces, showed how its fast-moving, hard-hitting forces can cover the world. A self-sustaining composite airstrike force is about to jump off across the Pacific to Thailand in an exercise called Mobile Yoke. Also in 1960, a similar force deployed to the Middle East in an exercise called Quickspan.
refueling like this took place between the mainland and hawaii and between hawaii and the philippines the seven thousand mile pacific cop was made just a few hours flying time destination reached Deployments such as Mobile Yoke during 1960 served two important purposes. They foster goodwill between ourselves and our allies around the world. And they serve notice to any would-be aggressor that the Tactical Air Command can get there in a hurry with a powerful punch. Of course, it's not all business. After all, a guy's got to relax. With the deployment complete, it's time to head for home. TAC crews see a lot of the world, but they never stay long in one spot. The Tactical Air Command in 1960 demonstrated at home and overseas its ability to react swiftly with a determination born of dedication to the maintenance of peace. Any time, any thing, any place, continued the motto of the Military Air Transport Service as it chalked up one of its biggest years as the supplier of strategic airlift for the Department of Defense. These are scenes from the biggest peacetime airlift exercise of its kind ever held. In March 1960, Mats hauled 21,000 troops and 11,000 tons of combat cargo from bases all over the United States to Puerto Rico, and then carried it back again, all within 15 days. Big Slam served two objectives. It gave the Strategic Army Corps a combat readiness test of its hard-hitting STRAC units and tested successfully Matt's ability to surge from a peacetime to an almost doubled wartime aircraft utilization rate. Lessons rehearsed in Big Slam were put to use during the summer when the United Nations called on this country to supply airlift to the troubled Congo Republic. Matt C-124s and C-130s from the United States Air Forces in Europe brought in 75% of the UN troops and 19 out of every 20 tons of supplies. Refugees were the prime cargo for the return flights from the Congo as United States airlift responded to United Nations appeals for help in the troubled heart of Africa. This is Porto Montt, one of many Chilean cities devastated by earthquakes in late May of 1960. And again, it was our airlift force which brought relief to the suffering people in this South American country. Relief supplies totaling over 780 tons and two complete army hospitals were airlifted to the earthquake area in Matt's aircraft. Doctors, nurses, and medical technicians, almost 700 of them, were airlifted here to minister to the medical needs of these shocked and dazed victims. With thousands homeless, and normal transportation facilities disrupted by the quakes. Airlift planes flew hundreds of refugees to cities outside the earthquake zone, where they could live with relatives or with friends who opened their homes to these unfortunate victims of a rampage of nature. In relief of disaster, or in the face of emergency, 1960 was a year in which military airlift again proved its worth. Air Force Academy Falcons take to the field in Baltimore's Municipal Stadium for their first gridiron meeting with the middies of the Naval Academy. 
The middies, undefeated and nationally ranked, are favored to take the margin of the men in blue from Colorado. In this, the first of what will likely prove to be a traditional inter-service rivalry. The White Falcon and the Navy Goat seem quite blasé about the whole thing, as Navy's Mather kicks off to the Air Force. There to take it on his own 12 is Don Bauckham, who returns it up the middle to the 32. The Falcon's forward wall works well all afternoon, but the Air Force could not sustain an offensive march. A holding penalty inside the Navy 10 forced quarterback Mayo into setting up a field goal attempt with a third down pass. Mayo holds, Mike Rollins kicks, and the Air Force draws first blood. The Falcons lead three to nothing midway in the first quarter. The middies are unable to move successfully and try a field goal of their own from the 33. It rolls dead on the Air Force three yard line. The Falcons can't move it out. Mayo's punt attempt is blocked and the ball bounces Navy's way out of bounds on the six inch line. On the next play, Bellino, Navy's All-American, smashes over guard for the game's first TD. Navy passes for two extra points. Richie Mayo, rated one of the nation's best passers, found very few receivers this day. This one to Mike Quinlan in the second quarter clicked. The breaks just didn't go the Falcons' way. Navy put together two sustained drives for TDs. Penalties and intercepted passes set up two others. The Air Force had few plays like this Mayo to Parma pass to cheer about. In holding the Air Force, the Middies scored in each of the four quarters twice in the second. The Falcons' attack just couldn't get rolling against a smooth Navy combination led by Joe Bellino. The Air Force gritters can only look forward to future outings when, in building an Air Force-Navy football tradition, their time will come. In football, 1960 was not a banner year. This is the Air Force U-2, a versatile tool of upper altitude research. In June of 1960, this unusual aircraft completed a three-year program aimed at measuring amounts of radioactive fallout in the upper atmosphere generated by nuclear testing. Paper filters in the U-2's nose cone trap particles for later analysis. A small port in the nose cone admits the airflow to the filters. The U-2 flights in the high altitude sampling program were flown from bases in North Dakota, New York, Texas, Puerto Rico, and Argentina, which covered the Western Hemisphere from the Arctic to the Antarctic. The U-2, configured like a glider, can cruise at altitudes up to 70,000 feet for seven hours and cover 3,000 miles during this period. Note that on the takeoff roll, the outrigged gear drop off as the plane picks up speed. During the three-year program, over 4,000 samples were evaluated and the findings placed in the United Nations Library, information which the Defense Atomic Support Agency has determined will help the peoples of the world understand the unseen and needlessly feared phenomenon emitted by nuclear testing. Air Force U-2, an aircraft with unusual performance characteristics and a unique design, has contributed greatly to this nation's efforts to study and evaluate the presence of radioactive debris in the Earth's atmosphere, a highlight of 1960 research activities. 
Missile research and development quickened in pace during 1960. On May 20th, an operational type atlas flew 9,000 miles downrange on target from Cape Canaveral. It was the longest ICBM flight to that date. The Titan, in late stages of development, made its first full ICBM range flight on February 2nd and gave promise of a new operational ballistic missile during 1961 as the Air Force Missile Test Center began its second decade of missile testing. A new ICBM came on the Air Force scene in 1960. The Minuteman, a solid propellant powered weapon system, is to be launched from unattended underground hard sites. Early launch tests at Edwards Air Force Base proved highly successful. Since these tests were to study only launch characteristics, cables were attached to the missile to restrain it from flying too far. Space in Utah played an important role in Minuteman development. Because of its solid propellant engines, the Minuteman lends itself to a mobile launch pad concept of operation. This train is actually a test unit, which may someday deploy the Minuteman around the country on existing rail lines. Because the Minuteman train can roll in random patterns around the nation, it would be impossible for an enemy to pinpoint its launch site for destruction. And complete communications make the system able to respond immediately. As the men travel, they have all the conveniences of home. A crew of 48 Air Force and civilian technicians made several two-week trips aboard the train in 1960 to check out its systems and to determine what technical adjustments must be made before the train is ready to roll with operational missiles. We'll track vibrations as the train moves at high speeds, produce problems in the missile's delicate electronic and guidance systems. Special instruments will tell. Will the train's extensive communication systems experience problems in maintaining constant contact with SAC headquarters as it flies the mountain railroad routes? Minute by minute contact with the command post at SAC headquarters was always maintained and the system performed so satisfactorily that future plans for deploying the Minuteman aboard these mobile launch pads will add to this nation's deterrent posture. So with the train concept and an underground silo launch capability, the Air Force is developing a one-two punch with the Minuteman ICBM. <laughs> 